Okay, did everybody get one? Again, happy Mother's Day. We are so grateful to you uh, in our congregation. I'm going to read you this story before we, or as we get started. You guys know who Buster Douglas is? Okay, guys know who Buster Douglas is. He competed with Mike Tyson. You know who Mike Tyson is. Iron Mike, they call him, the heavyweight champion of the world for the title. The champ not only defeated those uh, put in front of him, but annihilated them. As the time came for Douglas to enter the ring, the experts did not give him a chance. In the eighth round, Mike Tyson knocked out Douglas. But Douglas got back up and kept fighting. In the tenth round, Douglas lands an uppercut that sends the champ to the ground. Tyson never recovers, and Douglas becomes the new heavyweight champion of the world. Commenting on the win, Douglas said, listen to me, it's really simple. Before my mother died, she told the whole world that I was going to beat Mike Tyson. And two days before the fight, my mother died. Douglas was inspired and encouraged by his mom. He was fighting for something more meaningful than a championship. He was fighting for mom because mom first fought for him. Moms have a way of inspiring us. Moms have a way of building our courage. They have a way of nurturing us. And I just recall, even as a kid and and even as an, an adult, that after talking with my mom, I felt like I could go out and whip the world. And so we say thank you to mothers here on this Mother's Day. Now, we owe a great deal to our mothers, and I think taking only a day out of the entire year to celebrate moms, it's just, I think it's kind of chintzy. I think it ought to be at least a week or maybe even a month. We have a month of everything else. Why not have a month for mothers? You guys all in favor of that? Say aye. aye. There you go. Okay, so, so let it be written. Um, it should be a whole month to celebrate moms, but we're going to try to convey just how we feel about our moms today and how much we, appreciation we have for you. So it's fitting that today is Mother's Day because it marks the beginning of an eight-week series on the family. And so throughout uh, this month and next month, uh, we will be exploring what God says about the family. It's no secret that the nuclear family is under attack. Families are broken and in bad need of restoration. Now, I could offer many statistics to make my point, but let me just give you one. Currently, there are 2.3 million men and women who are incarcerated in the United States. Now, that number may not be that outrageous. Out of a number of more than 330 million U.S. population, 2.3 might not seem like a, a big deal. But let me give you these stats. The United States is 5% of the world population, and yet it has 25% of the population that is incarcerated. The United States imprisons, incarcerates more people than any other world, any other country. That's a glaring fact. Today, nearly 25 million children have an absentee father. According to the professional literature, the absence of the father is the single most important cause of poverty. The same is true for crime. Of all adolescents, those in 
intact married families are the least likely to commit delinquent acts. Children of single parent homes are more likely to be abused, have emotional problems, engage in questionable behavior, struggle academically, and become delinquent. Problems with children from fatherless families can continue into adulthood. These children are three times more likely to end up in jail by the, by the time they reach age 30 than the children raised in intact families and have the highest rates of incarceration in the United States. Lord willing, we're going to address the problem or the issue uh, with fathers on Father's Day. And I thank God that in our church we have so many fathers who are tuned in to God's Word and are great examples to their children, to our church, and to our community. We'll address that. But for today, I want to talk to you about the breakdown of the nuclear family. There are many industries organizations and political ideologies and individuals they are actively and systematically out to destroy the family. So what can we do? I'm glad you asked that question. Because there's an answer. The answer is found in Scripture. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. I've titled today's sermon, A Message from God is Every Mother's Dream. It is the dream of every parent, I believe, to hear from God, especially in regards to their children. I've met many new parents who are scared to death as they hold their newborn baby because they don't know what to do. They say things like, this thing doesn't come with an instruction manual. Or they might say, I'm so afraid I'm going to break it. I want you to know that parenting does come with a manual. If God blesses you with a child, you can bet that he has instructions for you in his book. Now today we're going to look at just one. We're going to look at one of those instructions. There's, there's a message from God re regarding your child. And it's found in Deuteronomy. Just a little background on Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is, the, is, the, is the, the last of the first five books in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy means second law. It's retelling by, it's a retelling by Moses of the teachings and events in uh, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. It includes a, sort of an expansion, an extended review of the Ten Commandments. We find that in chapters 4 and chapters 5. It also includes Moses' farewell address to the new generation of Israelites as they Stand ready to take possession of the promised land. You remember that he was not allowed to cross over into the promised land because of his disobedience. And here Moses in Deuteronomy reminds them of God's faithfulness uh, and love. But also of God's wrath for the previous gen generation because of their rebellion and disobedience. Repeatedly throughout Deuteronomy, he charges them, he challenges them to keep the law, to obey the law. Deuteronomy is a solemn call to love and obey the one true God. There are blessings of faithfulness and curses for unfaithfulness. And the book then closes with the selection of Joshua as the new leader for God's people who will lead them 
into the promised land. Now we know traditionally that uh, the first five books was written by uh, Moses. And I think that's true except for the last chapter. Because the last chapter in Deuteronomy 34 is about the death of Moses. Now I don't know if Moses could have written about his own death. So somebody else must have written that and perhaps the accounts of Joshua uh, taking the reins, that is also recorded in chapter 34. And so aside from that, though, I think it was written by Moses. Now, I want to just give you a summary of the first five books uh, that Moses wrote. Genesis, we all know that that's about creation and how God created the heavens and the earth. And then it, it speaks of the, of the fall and then the flood with Noah. And then also, then in chapter 12, is uh, Abraham's call and God's covenant with Abraham and God's promise to him that he would make them uh, into, make Abraham's offspring into a great people. Exodus, of course, we know that that is primarily the deliverance of God's people from Egypt after they were enslaved for 400 years and Moses leading them out of Egypt to the promised land. That's where the Ten Commandments are given by God on the tablets. And then we have Leviticus. Now, the Le Leviticus is all about the use of the temple, uh, I mean the tabernacle. So this tabernacle that God commanded them to build as they were wandering in the wilderness, and he had rules and regulations in how to treat that tabernacle and how to conduct themselves there were a series of 613 of these laws these these rules these commands it included what was clean and unclean how you should slaughter or sacrifice animals cooking instructions the proper and improper use of fire i mean it it just went all of the things that they did in the tabernacle and how, what they were supposed to eat, how they were supposed to eat it, all that is found in Leviticus. And then Numbers is an account of how they continue to wander in the wilderness for 40 years because of their disobedience. And now when you come to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is the conclusion of that. It's the end of of the 40 years, and they're getting ready to cross over the River Jordan into the promised land. And Moses is writing to them. The old generation is gone. This is the new generation. And Moses is saying, listen, remember what happened to the old generation. They disobeyed God. And they are not allowed to enter into the promised land. But God is giving you this blessing, giving you this, this promised land. And in order for you to honor God in that new land, here's what you need to know. So what we read in Deuteronomy is what, what God wanted them to know through Moses. Now, as we go through this passage, we're going to... I've never done this before, so you're going to have to bear with me. Uh, there are nine verses that I want to look at. Joshua, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 through 9. And we're going to take eight weeks to look at nine verses. Okay? So, uh, just bear with me in this, okay? Now, as we go through this passage for the next eight weeks, I want you to consider these questions. I want you to consider these questions. I want you to consider the study of this passage in the context of parenting. Now, if you don't have children, don't tune it out and say, okay, for the next eight weeks, this is not going to matter. 
Because I believe that every person who is a Christian has children. You may not have biological children, but you have spiritual children. Jesus said, go and make disciples and, 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 and teaching them to observe everything that I've taught you and, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you, you understand that discipleship is about starting out as, a, as an infant and then growing into a young man and then becoming an adult, a parent, a spiritual parent where you have spiritual children that you are nurturing as you grow. So every person in the kingdom of God has spiritual children. So in the context of parenting, I want you to be thinking of these three questions as we go through this. Question number one is, what are you passing on to your children? That's a question I think needs to be answered. Question number two is, what will your children remember about you? Do, they want, do you want them to remember about how devoted you were to Christ? Or that you were never available? Or that you were always angry? What do you want your children to remember about you? Number three is, if all your children know about God comes from you, would they know enough about God to be a Christian? With those questions in mind, I want us to look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 through 9. I'm just going to read all the, the verses, but then we're going to look at only one. It says, verse 1, Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the rules that the Lord God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land in which you are going over to possess it. And that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, all the days of your life. And that your days may be long. Hear, O therefore Israel, and be careful to do them, and it may be go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them which, uh, when, when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. We see in verses 4 through 9, it's, that's what we, uh, it's called the Shema. It's, uh, it means, in Hebrew, it means to hear. So we hear that, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Shema, O Israel. Now, according to Judaism, this is one of the only two prayers that are commanded in the Torah. Torah is, is the Hebrew word for the first five books. 
is the oldest fixed daily prayer. And they, the true Jewish uh, followers, believers, will cite this prayer every morning and every night. Well, they will tell you every night and every morning. Because in, in the Jewish uh, daily calendar, the day starts when the sun goes down. That's why night is mentioned here before day. When you lie down and when you rise. We say from morning to night. They say from night to morning. They are devoted to this prayer. It is the central theological affirmation of the Jewish faith. So we're going to look at verse 1, though, today. What is God's will for parents? Verse 1. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it. Notice that Moses has three categories of teaching for God's people. And he's saying, he's saying, these are not my words, these are not my teachings, but these are God's teaching. This is what God has commanded me to teach you. There are three things. Number one, commandment. We see that that's singular. The commandment is, the, the definition of that is obligation. This is your obligation. This is your duty. It's your responsibility. This is your commitment. The original word there is mitzvah. Have you heard that word before? Bar mitzvah. Bar meaning son. So when the Jewish, in the Jewish tradition, when you have a bar mitzvah, son of responsibility, when you're 13, they're saying that you are now responsible yourself to follow God. Bar mitzvah. Let me tell you something. Obeying God is your single greatest commitment. Loving God is your single greatest command. Obeying God is your single greatest commitment. It's your obligation. It's your responsibility. So he says... Now, this is the commandment, and then the statutes and the rules. So, statutes is plural, and rules are plural. Statutes are boundaries. They're allotments. They're the limits. This is the most amazing thing. It's it's awesome that God gives us allotments. He gives us boundaries. And he says, within these boundaries, knock yourself out. Have a good time. But stay in the boundaries. The problem is, we don't want to stay in the boundaries because we somehow think that that's confining. It's not that it's confining. It's that we just want to go right up to the edge. And, and just like when a, when a mom says, don't go out in the street, some kids will go right up to the curb And they will stand there until mom's not looking and they'll do this. Just because they, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just that spirit of rebellion that we have, right? But we must understand that God gives us boundaries and those boundaries, what they do is they provide us with freedom. Not just freedom, but they provide us with protection. It's interesting, uh, Dobson uh, cited this study that they did in this elementary school, and and this elementary school had um, a fence all the way around it. And they felt like that the the kids, uh, some study that they came up with is how when you put parameters around kids, that they 
they can't learn as well and they can't study and they don't, they don't you know, their, their minds can't, their imaginations can't, uh, can't expand. So they did this experiment where the kids were running around, they were going all the way up to the fence and having a good time and feeling this freedom that they had at playtime. They took the fence down. When they took the fence down, all of a sudden, the kids huddled around the building, and they were afraid to go out further because there was no fence to protect them. Isn't that interesting? God gives us a fence. He gives us a boundary so that we can enjoy life. It's not to confine us, but it's to protect us. And even elementary students in their DNA, because they're created in the image of God, even they got that, even though they didn't understand why they got that. So, boundaries, statutes are boundaries. So God says, stay in these lines. Now, rules, we read this and we go, rules, well, rules are a bunch of do's and don'ts. Do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. Right? That's what we think. But that's not what this is. This is talking about rulings, as we might say, in court. So these are like decisions that are handed down. Judgments. Sentences. So, to summarize what Moses is saying here, parents' greatest command and obligation is to obey the boundaries and allotments that God gives us in order to obtain positive judgments and outcomes and to avoid negative judgments and sentences or consequences. Now notice where the command and the statutes and the rules, where they come from, they come from the Lord. The Lord your God commanded me to teach you. They they didn't come from Moses. They came from God himself. As I said earlier, Moses wasn't even allowed to enter into the promised land because of his own disobedience. He, He went outside the boundaries and he is suffering the consequences as a result. And so he's speaking with experience. He's like, guys, we just got through wandering in the desert for 40 years because of our disobedience. And now you are about to go over and take the land. Don't make the mistakes that your moms and your dads made. Enjoy the blessings of God by staying in His boundary, by being obedient. Moses saying, I can't go with you. You get this feeling that, you know, I mean, Moses was their leader, so they're kind of like his spiritual children, are they not? He's like, guys, listen. Listen. To what God says. Then he says that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it. This word do, it's this, that same word is all throughout Genesis chapter 1. When God says, God made this, God made that. Everything that he made, that word made, is the same word as the word here, do. In fact, that's what it means. The word either means do or, or to make. It's the same word. It's found throughout. In fact, let me just look at uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. It says, And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetari- uh, vegetation, plants yielding seed, and the fruit trees bearing, same word, Bearing fruit, making fruit, doing fruit, in which is their seed. Each according to its kind on the earth, and it was so. Verse 12, the earth brought forth vegetation, 
plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing, doing, making fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Heeding his command. Staying in, in his boundaries. In order to avoid negative judgment and consequences and enjoy the blessings of good judgments. God says that's good. And Moses says, go do that. And then verse, I, I, I hope that you get the magnitude of that. If you just read through it, just, oh yeah, go do it. it. I hope you get the magnitude of that word. It's the same word that describes the creation, God's creation of all things. Verse 4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words I have commanded you that today that you shall, it shall be on your heart. Verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign of on your heart, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. That's what he said to the Israelites about to take the promised land. But how does it apply to us? What is God saying to a parent today? What's his message for us? And that's what we're going to look at for the next seven weeks now after today. We're going to look at it. We're going to try to break it down the best we can. But for now, consider this application. Moms. Dads. Spiritual moms. Spiritual dads. If you want to enjoy God's blessing and fruitfulness in your life and in your children's life, do what the Lord says. Do what he says. Now we're going to explore in detail in the coming weeks of what the Lord says. But it starts with our resolve to be obedient. So my challenge to you is today, resolve to obey the Lord today. Don't wait for eight weeks to say, okay, well, I want to know what's in it for me. I want to know how much commitment I'm going to have to have. Just, I mean, it's like I'm going to, I'm going to wait it out and I'm going to weigh my options. Well, if that's your heart, that's your attitude, you've already lost. But if you know God, you know that He's not going to give you anything that you can't handle. He's not going to give you anything that's not good for you. He's not going to tell you to do something that is, that's not going to result in a blessing for you. And if you ask me, that's all I need from God. I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything you ask me to, Lord. Resolve to obey the Lord today. Moms, dads, do you need to hear from God to know what to do with your children? Resolve to obey the Lord today. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that we have your word 
that gives us instructions on what to do with our families. Lord, we know that the families are under attack right now in this, in this country. It's been under attack for many years, but it is, it's on steroids now. It is escalated. It is, it is like none we ever seen before. Marriage is under attack. The education system is under attack. Lord, we need you to intervene in our families. In our school systems, the things that they're being taught, instead of teaching education, they're, they're teaching all kinds of, of deviant, devilish, satanic falsehoods and untruths. And they're trying to infiltrate our children's minds and to brainwash them and to manipulate them into believing a certain way that, that is completely and totally contrary to your word. And Lord, we have churches that are filled with families who don't know what to do. Families themselves and the churches are falling apart because they're not living by the boundaries that you set for them. I pray, Lord, that you will turn our families back to you. Not just in our church, but in, in your church across the globe, that you would turn your families back to you, back to your word, back to your truth. And that you would strengthen our families. That you would fortify our families. You would build our families to be so strong that no storm that they encounter can destroy them. God, we thank you that at the center of that strength is our mothers. They're our, our nursing station. Our counseling couch. Our soup kitchen. They provide for us in so many ways, Lord. We are grateful. We are thankful for our mothers. May they be blessed today in a mighty way. And God, we know that there are people in, in our midst and, and those who are hearing by live stream that this is maybe perhaps the first Mother's Day without their mother. God, would you wrap your love around them just extra tight, extra special today? For those of us who are not able to hug our mothers because they've been long gone, Lord, thank you for the memory that lives in our hearts and the impact that they have had on our lives. And Lord, we know that there are people who have prayed and have wanted to be mothers, but for some reason it, it never came to reality. I thank you, Lord, that they have had a major impact on so many people. And maybe not biological children, but certainly spiritual children and that they have a legacy of people who have been influenced in a mass, massive major way. Lord, thank you for them as well. God, we thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.